Hey guys, this is a follow-up video to the one where I recently broke open a 12 LP4 and we looked, took a look at the electron gun. Some questions came up, some topics came up about other aspects of the picture too, but this would be a great opportunity to talk about it while I've got several out. One of which is the coating that some picture tubes have. They don't all have it. This one does, this one does on the outside. That is a conductive graphite coating that gets grounded. It's not for shielding, exactly. It works in conjunction with the internal coating. Now this one doesn't have any external coating, but see all this blackness. It starts up on the neck about here and goes all the way down near the front. That is conductive. That is connected via this to high voltage. So yes, the entire interior surface of this bell and part of the neck is at the full high voltage potential. Glass is an insulator. If we put a conductive coating on the outside and ground it, we have a capacitor. The high voltage that's produced out of a flyback is very noisy. It's driven by the horizontal oscillator, so it has nearly 16 kilohertz of ripple on it. So high frequency ripple. We want to eliminate that in two ways. One, you can use a high voltage capacitor on the output, little ceramic doorknob caps. Almost every set has them, 500 picofarad. But we can also make use of this. If we ground the outside, it forms around 500 picofarad, the way they design them with the geometry and whatnot. Some sets, lower end sets in particular, dispense with the ceramic doorknob cap and rely entirely on the pitcher tube to do the filtering, in which case it is essential to have it. Some sets like this and other early sets in particular, they didn't rely on that. The tubes didn't have the coating. I don't know if they hadn't invented it yet or they didn't want to rely on it. They didn't think it was dependable enough, but those absolutely have to have a ceramic capacitor or two filtering it elsewhere. And this does not form any type of filtering. Some sets use both. And you'll often see a resistor between the two around one mega ohm. So you've got a capacitor, resistor, another capacitor, forms a pi filter, makes an excellent high voltage filter. So, do you have to have it? Depends. If it is flaking off, you can replace it. There's a commonly available product called Slip Plate. And you certainly get it from Granger. Uh, I imagine other industrial supply places sell it. It is a spray-on graphite. They sell it as a lubricant, a dry lubricant, because the graphite is slippery. But it has enough adhesion, you can spray it onto the glass and it will stick, do a few passes. It's inexpensive, it's a great way to replace it. Now that leads to another excellent question and I don't have a definitive answer on this. So if you're used to a vacuum tube, a typical circuit, you've got your heater, you got your cathode, uh, electrons are zooming out of the cathode, modulated by the grid and they're shooting up to the plate. When the plate goes to a load to complete the circuit and the electrons go back around and get recycled and recirculated and they keep going around. Picture two, we've got, yeah, our cathode, our grid, electrons shooting down and they're attracted towards this. Where do they go? We don't have a plate. We don't have a load. They can't all be hitting this. They, because in the picture, the front of the CRT wouldn't glow. They have to be coming around and hitting the phosphor on the front. Okay, which glows, which does absorb the energy from the electron, but the electron doesn't just disappear. Uh, it does build up a static charge. I'm sure you've all experienced that, especially on color sets. So you run your knuckle by it and you can feel the static. You may even get a little spark from it. So that's where some of it's going. But surely not all, if you're running this up for hours, you can just have an accumulation of static electricity build up indefinitely. 
and you're not getting big arcs like a Van de Graaff generator <laughs> periodically coming out. So where are they going? I've seen his ass online. Various theories were proposed. One of which was that the yeah, glass is an insulator, but maybe the electrons are kind of crawling on the surface and making their way back to the maybe the DAG coating, or they're just sort of bleeding off into well, I was going to say the ether, but <laughs> into the vacuum or into, into air. Air is also not an absolutely perfect conductor. Like I said, I don't know. I don't have a definitive answer, and I haven't seen it in any textbooks. Uh, I haven't done extensive research on it, but um, I've never seen it clearly explained how that works. If any of you know, uh, any of you guys uh, into physics or just uh, have encountered the, the definitive answer, I would love to hear it and share it with everyone. Now you may notice something different about the two outside CRTs. Aside from being rectangular, they're shiny, whereas this one is dark on that interior coating. The early CRTs they used a graphite type conductive coating, then phosphor on the front, and then they probably clear coated with lacquer or something like that to protect it. Problem with that is when they pull the vacuum on this, when they suck out the air, there's always going to be a few molecules of air floating around inside. Even with a shiny getter, there's still maybe some nitrogen, oxygen, whatever. That will, those molecules will get accelerated by the electron gun, and they will smash into the phosphor and damage it permanently. And you just start getting a brown spot. It gets bigger and bigger, and it's very noticeable when you're watching. The TV. Now, the early pre-war sets, they just lived with it. They figured, well, eventually you just buy a new picture tube. Such, it was such a new thing that, uh, that that was acceptable. And even one or two post-wars, especially Dumont, they sold some sets that did not have ion traps. I have one of them, and yes, there is a, <laughs> about a one-inch diameter brown spot in the middle. Luckily, some of them with the idea of, hey, we'll bend the electron gun. And we'll use an external magnet. Electrons being lighter, they're much more easily deflected by a magnetic field. So if we do it right, the ions will go to the side and hit the neck. And the electrons will get bent by the magnetic field enough that they continue straight on down. Those are a pain to adjust and it makes the guns a little bit more complicated. There's a better way, thankfully, someone came up with, which is to aluminize the pitcher tubes. So rather than having a graphite conductive surface, they, do, they vacuum deposit aluminum on the inside. And not just for the high voltage, but also the entire surface going all the way down to where the phosphor is. It turns out that if electrons hit a super thin layer of aluminum, they'll continue through it and hit the phosphor and excite it. But also, any light that gets reflected towards the back hits the aluminum and then comes out the front. So not only do you not get any ion burn, you don't need an ion trap, they're actually a little bit brighter, a little bit better definition to them. They, those came on the market around 47. I think GE was the first to come out with them with their daylight TVs. I even have a model 802 from 47. Well, they drew a line through 10 BP4 on the tube chart and wrote by hand 10 FP4. And it's got a really, really early 10 FP4 in it. You can tell that because the way it's made, it looks kind of crude. But it must have been expensive to do because for years, non aluminized dominated. 48, 49, probably 99% of 10 inch CRTs were still non aluminized 10 BP4s rather than the much superior 10 FP4. And even well into the 50s, the portable sets from 57, like by Admiral, they had non-aluminized CRTs. I think 58 was the tipping point. Around 58, everything made from then on were aluminized. So this, for example, is a 58 or a 59 CRT. But this is early. This is like a 51. That's a 17 BP4. But they offered a 17 BP for A, B, C, and this is the D version. Vastly more non-aluminized than aluminized. I'm curious how much more could it have caused giving the benefits of not having to use the ion trap, which somebody on the assembly line would have had to install and adjust for every set made. If it was a couple bucks more to aluminize it, 
and she eliminate a stage in the assembly process and all that. You would have thought overnight everybody would have switched to it, but it took about a decade. I'm curious how much more could it have cost? Or maybe it was a lengthy process and it was more of a time factor. I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, that's going to be it for now. If there are any other topics, any other questions you have, please share them in the comments. Thanks for watching.